as you can see, the subject is why you should take CPP at 70. Um, it's uh, a little broader than that, but it's uh, this is a very important topic uh, when we look at retirement planning. Now, first of all, um, it's not hasn't been talked about much because most investment advice out there is focusing on the accumulation phase. So they're assuming that people are still saving and that they're somewhere on this chart um, in terms of their saving for retirement. Maybe they started at 25 or 27 or 32, and maybe they're currently age 45, but they're somewhere along that, that curve, um, saving money for retirement, and their big questions are, how much should I be saving, and uh, how should the money be invested? So those are, are the, uh, that would be the gist of most investment advice out there. Now, um, my focus um, for this presentation is different. I'm looking more at the end of the accumulation phase. The question is no longer how much money should I be saving because you're no longer saving. You're at the verge of retirement. And uh, the question then is, well, now that I've got my savings, uh, my nest egg, how much of that money can I be spending uh, going forward? Now, the funny thing is that even when we should be at the end of our accumulation phase, because we're now on the verge of retirement, we don't leave that accumulation phase very easily. This has been borne out by at least a couple of studies, and there are others out there. For example, there was a study done by the Society of Actuaries in 2015, and they uh, interviewed retirees. They found that um, most retirees in the study were still focused on maintaining or even growing their asset levels, so whatever nest egg they had for, for retirement, they were still thinking about growing it after they had retired, even though they ought to be drawing an income. Uh, much along the same lines, um, in 2018, a study was done by the Employee Benefit Research Inst Institute, and it found that median asset levels, that would be median like halfway between the top and the bottom, median asset levels in that study after 18 years of retirement had fallen by only 27% for the middle group. That was people who had retired with between $200,000 and $500,000. And uh, even more dramatic, for the highest asset group, those who had more than $500,000, the, um, the median amount of asset uh, level had fallen by only 11.8%. In other words, they still had almost nine-tenths as much money after 18 years as they had at the point of retirement. What's even more amazing is that in the case of that highest asset group, 35.5% of them had more assets after 18 years of, of drawing an income from their retirement. So how do we interpret that? Um, there might be a couple of ways. I mean, you can view that either as being good news or bad news. Uh, the good news is that uh, obviously people can get by without spending very much because we don't hear horror stories about how people hate retirement. Um, in fact, surveys show that uh, about nine people in ten say that they enjoy life uh, just as much, if not more, after retirement than they ever did before retirement. So that's good news. So with whatever assets they have and however they're now drawing down their money, they say that uh, well, they, they can they, they still still say that they're enjoying their lives. Now the bad news is uh, it suggests that we're uncomfortable with uh, decumulation. It's uncomfortable with spending our money. After all, we're we're barely spending any of it, as we saw from that EBRI study, and we're intent on on trying to even grow it further. So there's a lot of anxiety out there about seeing that asset level fall throughout the course of our retirement. And that, uh, as I say, brings us to the whole question of decumulation. What is it? Decumulation is what starts when um, accumulation ends or saving ends. It's the art of drawing down your savings and other assets to produce income in retirement. So that EBRI study we saw, the one that shows that people's asset levels were had hardly fallen at all, that kind of suggests that we're afraid of running out of money. And uh, we figure just to be on the safe side, we'll uh, try to save almost all of it um, and uh, just not see it falling at all over the course of time. Now, the question is, by doing that, we're probably not getting the most out of our savings. If we're not spending that money, uh, in our 60s and 70s and waiting until our 80s, we are probably waiting too long. That certainly is what studies seem to show. And that was the reason for my third book, uh, Retirement Income for Life, Getting More Without Saving More. Now, 
In that book, I talked about five enhancements. Uh, enhancement one, reducing management fees. Uh, we uh, In the book, I show that if you can bring the fees down, uh, that it uh, has a very material difference in how long your, your money uh, can last after retirement. Enhancement two, which is what we're talking about today, is about transferring risk back to the government. Enhancement three, and we'll obviously have much more to say about that in a little while. Enhancement three is offloading even more risk onto insurance companies, and that would be by way of uh, purchasing an annuity uh, with only a part of your money, of course, not all of it. Enhancement four, adjusting your spending to fit your needs. That's like a dynamic spending model. You can't just assume that whatever money you're spending the first year of retirement, you'll keep on spending that regardless uh, and plus inflation in future years. It just doesn't work. And finally, enhancement five, uh, liquidating non-financial assets if necessary to supplement your income. Uh, that's something we won't be looking at today, but another tool in the uh, in the arsenal. Um, now, I'm going to make the assumption, which uh, can be challenged, the assumption that the primary purpose of our savings is to provide lifetime income. It seems almost obvious, except when you actually see what retirees do, the fact that they're not spending their money. So we might challenge that assumption later on. But for now, we're going to make the assumption that you've saved your, your whole life, your whole working life, and now you want to uh, extract the, the maximum amount of lifetime income from that, those savings. So um, let's do it with an example. I'm going to look at uh, Carl and Hannah. Um, Carl is uh, age 65 and Hannah is 62. And they're just about to retire. They've got half a million dollars in RRSP assets between the two of them. So here's what they do. And this I'm calling scenario one. They transfer that money into uh, in savings into a, a RIF or a registered retirement income fund which, of course, as you all know, is essentially the same as a uh, as an RRSP, except you don't add to it. You uh, simply draw an income from there. Um, we're setting up that RIF uh, to be in, in an asset mix that would be 60% equities and 40% bonds. Uh, arguably, it could be different, but that's a, a nice middle-of-the-road kind of a setting. Uh, that seems to be the uh, asset mix of choice for pension fund managers for the past half century. Um, I'm also assuming, for the sake of argument, that investment fees are 1.5%. Um, they can be much higher if one is investing in, in high-cost retail um, mutual funds, and they can also be lower if one is in ETFs, and obviously uh, investment fees are also affected by whether or not one has a financial advisor helping out and charging additional fees on top of the funds themselves. So this is a nice middle-of-the-road assumption. Can be more, can be less probably is more in most cases. I'm assuming that uh, Carl and Hannah take their Canada pension plan immediately, and this is scenario one, and that they draw enough income from the RIF to produce $54,000 in total. So they've got their OAS starting at 65, they got their CPP, and they also have the income from the RIF. Those are the three sources of income. And in total, it produces $54,000. Um, I'm also assuming that Carl dies at age 88 and Hannah dies later. Finally, I'm assuming that investment returns um, that they have from that point on end up being very poor, what I call the fifth percentile. Now, let me explain what that means when I talk about 50th percentile. Uh, if you have a 60-40 asset mix, 60% uh, equities, uh, investment returns can, be, can fluctuate very wild, wildly. This uh, chart shows it. Now, the, that bar on there represents um, all the possible investment returns from the 5th percentile to the 95th percentile. So, um, and this is based on a Monte Carlo simulation. So, for example, it's showing uh, at the very top end uh, that uh, there's a, um, a small chance that one can have a return in a given year of uh, of 17%. Um, and on the bottom end, it shows that the return can be as low as minus eight percent. Now, I've truncated the top five, the top five percent, and bottom five percent of the uh, returns because at the tails it can um, really fan out wildly, and so it could go much lower than minus ten or much higher than t plus twenty. But that would happen so rarely that we can pretty much ignore that scenario. Now I'm assuming that we're going to be at the bottom one of at the bottom of that bar, so that's where the kind of return that Carl and Hannah get. 
The reason I'm doing that is because I, I think when it comes to investments, it's best to hope for the best, but um, plan for the worst so that you can still survive even if uh, the worst case scenario does happen. So I'm assuming worst case scenario here means uh, a return of minus 5%. Sorry, a return at the fifth percentile. Now, here's how it looks in future years. Uh, over a two-year period, for example, the fifth percentile, like the average annualized return is just a little bit uh, better than minus 5%. And then eventually it becomes positive, i.e. by year nine, uh, the, the bottom, the worst case scenario is just about a return of 0%. And finally, after 30 years, the worst case scenario is a return of about uh, uh, 3%. Best case would be a return of about 7 So that funnel uh, gets narrower over time. So, so I'm assuming that we're at the bottom of uh, of the of uh, the, those bars in all years. Um, in the case of Carl and Hannah. So here's what happens as a result. If they uh, were drawing the fifty-four thousand uh, dollars, this is shown on uh, by the combination of um, purple bars and orange bars. The purple bars is the income that they get from their Canada Pension Plan and old age security. You'll notice that. Uh, the, the, there's a bump up in the uh, CPPOAS income at age 68. That's because that's when Carl is 68, Hannah turns 65, and she starts getting OAS. And that's why there's a bump up. Uh, before that, they're both getting CPP, and, but only Carl's getting OAS. So that's the orange part. I'm sorry, that's the uh, purple part. Then the orange part would be the income from the RIF. And as I mentioned, that is uh, whatever is needed to get up to $54,000 in year one and then that uh, climbs with inflation in future years. But you notice because of their uh, poor investment returns, they run out of money by the time Carl's age 82, which means Hannah's only 79 when that happens. This is just about the worst thing that could possibly happen to uh, um, a couple in retirement. So let's analyze what happened uh, here. Um, Obviously, uh, the poor investment returns hurt them. We know that, but it's more than that. We can't just make that excuse and say, well, there's nothing they can do about it. That certainly was one thing that happened. Now, the fairly high investment fees also hurt them a little bit. Um, as I mentioned, 1.5%, not terribly high, but on the other hand, it can also be lower, which was enhancement one in, in, in the book. Um, they could have gotten some downside protection, um, the, which means obviously giving up a little bit of upside potential by buying an annuity. If they had, say, uh, used 25% of the money in their RIF uh, to buy an annuity at the point at the start of retirement, then um, then those bars we saw earlier showing the uh, investment returns would have been narrower, and the worst case scenario wouldn't have been wouldn't have been quite as bad. That was enhancement three. Um, now they should also have been reducing their income. We saw that you know, they just kept on spending fifty-four thousand plus inflation year after year. And uh, in reality, uh, if those bad investment returns persisted, they should have actually started reducing their spending to kind of uh, uh, fit their means, especially in their seventies. Um, finally, uh, they could have used their home equity as a final resort uh, once they got to their eighties, um, and that is by by using uh, by taking out a reverse mortgage. So those are all things that they could have done, but we're only going to focus on one thing today, and that is only on when they draw their CPP. So at, at scenario one, they draw their CPP uh, at the point of retirement, 62 for Hannah, 65 for Carl. So now let's look at scenario two. The difference here, the only difference, is that Carl and Hannah start their CPP at age 70. Now, obviously, if they're starting at 70, it means that they have no CPP before 70, and that creates an income gap, and it means that they need to draw just that much more income from their RIF up until the time that uh, they both hit 70. Um, we uh, will still make the same assumption about investment fees, 1.5%, and we'll also make the same assumption about investment returns. They don't do, they don't do any better than they did before. They're still at the fifth percentile for investment returns, the same as in scenario one. But here's what happens now. As a result of uh, the um, uh, of deferring their CPP until age 70, their income now lasts much longer. It lasts until Carl's age 88. And, uh, and even after age 88, the gap, even though there is a gap now, it's much smaller than it was. By the way, that remaining gap would have actually gone away if the other enhancements had been invoked, i.e. enhancements one, 
and three and four. We don't. We wouldn't even have to resort to enhancement five, reverse mortgage. Now let's just look at this on a side by side basis, uh, just to make it look a, uh, see more more clearly exactly what happened. First time where we start CPP early, um, their uh, income ran out when Carl was age 82, and there was a, a very large gap of about $20,000 in between the income they wanted and the income they had after age 82. In the second case, um, when CPP starts at 70, there's no gap at all until age 88. And after that, the gap is smaller. It's more in the range of $10,000 as opposed to $20,000. So uh, they've made uh, great strides by uh, starting CPP at 70 instead of uh, early. Now the question is why does this, what I call enhancement two, work so well? Um, so the following slides are going to outline the rules. We have to understand the rules better in, in order to understand why why this is working and to have more confidence in actually doing it. And uh, we're also going to find in the process that there will be the rare time when this particular strategy isn't advisable. So first of all, uh, consider um, what happens if you start CPP at age 70. Um, if you start at 65, uh, the maximum monthly CPP pension uh, now available, let's say in 2018, would be $1,134 per month. Um, now, it, that, we, to that you would add 8.4% um, for each year after 65 that CPP is deferred, plus inflation, by the way. But in real terms, we're adding 8.4%. So that means by age 70, 5 times 8.4 is 42%. So it means that CPP would be 42% higher uh, than at 65, plus inflation. So, uh, for example, if somebody uh, had the maximum CPP and uh, was age 70 in 2018 and started their CPP then, they would get $1,610 a year instead of $1,134. So, uh, graphically, what did we just do? Well, um, first of all, look at the yellow bars, which is starting CPP at 65. Um, and this is uh, Carl we're looking at now. He's, he doesn't have the maximum. He has $1,000 a month. And look at what happens now. He has 1000 bucks a month plus inflation. And that's what happens if he starts at 65. If he starts at 70, he has no, no CPP obviously before then, but it's 42% um, uh, higher uh, for every year after that. And, uh, and as you can see, that goes on no matter how long Carl ends up living. Now, I said 42%. In actual fact, and this is not all that well known, the um, uh, amount of CPP that one can get at 70 can be more than 42% bigger than at 65. And that's because uh, CPP is based on uh, the YMPE, the year's maximum pensionable earnings or earnings ceiling in the year of retirement and the four previous years. So they take an average, we're rolling average of five years of YMPE. So for example, in the year 2018, the YMP is $55,900. Now, the YMP, which is really the average national wage, um, rises with wage inflation, obviously, as opposed to price inflation. And those two things are not the same. So if wages rise faster than prices, then it means that CPP, um, uh, if you delay it, is going to rise faster than uh, than inflation. And, uh, and so as a result, the increase will be more than 42% bigger. So... Uh, if we look at the last 90 years uh, as our guide, we find that wages have been rising faster than prices by an average of 1.37% a year. Um, every That's on average for the last 90 years. Obviously, there'll be years, some years when it's more and some when it's been less. So even if we were conservative and assumed that it was going to be about uh, a 1% more each year between 65 and 70, then we should really be thinking in terms of, uh, of CPP at 70 providing 50% more than at 65, not 42% more. And that's because one uh, compounding, 5% well, on top of 42% compounded is more like 50%. So why is starting CPP late so effective? Well, first of all, that 42% or more increase carries on for life no matter how long you live. And uh, moreover, that higher amount is inflation protected. So if the lower amount was, in, was in being increased at inflation at 2% a year, then the higher amount's also going up by 2% a year, but 2% of a bigger number. 
Uh, also, uh, the payment is not affected by interest rates and investment returns. In other words, it is pretty safe. It's a predictable amount of pension, but now it's a much bigger amount than it was before. So by starting CPP, on a very big picture, what's happening is that the retiree is transferring both the investment risk and longevity risk back to the government. There's only one problem. Almost no one does this. Let's look at this chart, uh, which um, is taken from the CPP actuarial report. It shows the um, the the rate, the uh, ages at which people actually start collecting their Canada Pension Plan. First of all, this first of all, this is only males. Uh, for women, it's very similar, except um, slightly more of them start their CPP at 60 than is the case for men. But the chart looks very very much the same in terms of the uh, the overall uh, weightings. So for men, uh, for only 30, 34% of them start CPP as early as possible, which is age 60. Um, 61, at age 61, 5.5%, uh, and as you can see, there's a, a similar way of percentage starting at 62 through 64. Then there's another huge bump at 65, 41.6% of people started at 65, which is the first year at which it uh, is unreduced. Um, it's, there's no early retirement penalty. So that's one reason why so many people wait until 65 to start it. And then you see that there's very small percentages um, after 65. So, for example, uh, 66, 1.3% of people started then. And uh, if we look all the way to age 70, 0.7% uh, started then. Now, you might think, well, uh, based on everything I'm saying, that I, uh, I'm a, I'm applauding the people at 70 for starting it then, and uh, and those are the smart ones. I got a feeling that the vast majority of those people at 70 are actually starting CPP late by accident. Uh, they simply procrastinated. They never applied for it. They didn't realize they were able to get it, didn't know where to go. And so they just didn't start it until that time. And the reason I say that is because if you look at the next number, 71, it's actually 71 and over, 0.6% of people started at 71 and over. And this makes no sense because they're actually losing benefits. If they start at 71, they don't get the benefits between age 70 and 71. So for the, they miss 12 months worth of benefits. If they start at 72, they miss 24 months worth of benefits. So obviously, uh, that 0.6% simply missed the boat. And if that's the case at 71, then we have to assume it's probably the case for most people at 70 as well. So in other words, almost nobody in Canada starts a CPP at age 70, uh, at least knowingly and, uh, and with full intent that this is the right thing to do. So why is that the case? Why do so few people start it late? Uh, we're going to find a lot of reasons. Uh, from what I've seen, and I've had a few articles about this in the Globe and Mail, and I've seen the comments, um, I think the biggest fear is that they're afraid they're going to leave money on the table uh, by doing it. They come back and say, well, what happens if I die young? Um, so I want to get as much money from that CPP as I possibly can uh, before before that happens. Um, I've responded to them somewhat tongue-in-cheek. Well, if you die young, then you actually have a, a much bigger problem than leaving some CPP on the table, the problem being that you're dead. But uh, let's ignore that and, and look at whether or not they really are leaving money on the table in that case. So consider the value of your CPP pension to be the sum of the monthly payments you actually get up until the time of death plus the value of the surviving spouse pension. So if you have a, a, um, uh, a spouse who survives you, uh, he or she is going to get 60% of the amount you're getting, uh, but then there are some uh, limitations on that. There's a, a cap on the overall amount that one can get, uh, which we, we won't get into right now. So it gets a fairly complicated. But in any event, there's a cap on the, sorry, in any event, um, that the, uh, if what people should be wanting to do is is maximize the uh, the value of of those two amounts, the monthly payments they get plus the value of the spouse's pension. Now, so uh, so they want to maximize that value, which means you know even if it means that they're going to get less money uh, in extreme old age. So they might have seen that earlier chart showing uh, large amounts of CPP if they live until age 85 or 90, and they say, well, I don't care about that. All I want to do is make sure that I, I don't look foolish uh, posthumously because I died at 68 and I, I didn't start my CPP yet. Now, the question is, even if we go with this line of reasoning, 
does start, starting CPP early still give them the greatest value? Once again, we're going to go back to uh, Carl just to see if that's the case in Hannah. So uh, Carl's CPP is 1000 bucks a month. And Hannah's is um, $700 a month. So let's, what happens if Carl dies at 69, for example? So at 69, if he started at 65, he would have gotten four years worth of payments. Um, and um, at $1,000 a, a month for four years, uh, $48,000 plus some inflation in there, the present value of that, uh, if you discount at 3% per year interest, is maybe about $46,000. So that's what he would have got if he started CPP early, and obviously he doesn't get that if he uh, didn't start a CPP yet. There's also that the survivor benefit I mentioned, and that's worth about the same whether Carl starts at 65 or 70. In actual fact, it's worth a tiny bit more if he starts at 70, but we'll ignore that. And as a result, we can say that uh, Carl is leaving about $46,000 on the table by starting his CPP at age 70 instead of 65. So um, this, uh, what I've done now is I'm showing on this chart here the same thing at all other ages as well. So the 46,000 you can see at, well, it shows under 68, so that would be the end of age 68, uh, that, uh, that red bar. Uh, they're showing that he uh, would have lost, he'd be out of pocket by about $46,000 because he started CPP at age 70. And uh, it's maximized just at the, uh, if he dies just uh, uh, a moment before turning 70. Uh, that would be when he's uh, lost the most. And then the loss uh, ends up being less and less after that. But if you look at this chart, it would kind of uh, corroborate what you always thought. You would say, well, you know what? Uh, looks to me like it's almost a saw off whether or not I start early or late. And if that's being the case, then I really don't want to leave money on the table if I do die early. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to take my CPP early. This certainly doesn't suggest that one ought to be starting late. The trouble is, with this chart, though, is that it is um, it's kind of meaningless. And that's because it's showing possible gains or losses, but it's not weighing those losses or gains by probability of them happening. So I'm going to try to explain what this um, concept means by, uh, by an example. So let's say you enter a hockey pool. And let's say you have to you know, put your hand inside a box in order to pick your team, so you can't actually, you know, decide. Well, I'm going to pick the uh, the Predators to win the national, the Stanley Cup, or the Las Vegas Golden Knights, or whatever. So you have to, um, you know, do a blind draw. Now, if you pick the right team, then you win hundred hundred dollars, no matter who you pick. Now, um, if you draw, if you do the Predators at the beginning of the uh, of the series, the chances of winning the uh, yeah, your your ticket winning would have been 30% based on uh, the odds makers. If you drew the Leafs, the chances would have been about 10% uh, based on those same odds makers. So what that means is that the value of your Predators ticket would have been 30 bucks, 30% uh, times a $100 win. And the value of a Leafs ticket would have been $10. So as much as you might like the Leafs, you'd have to say, well, you know what, if the Predators make a lot more sense just because they, uh, they have much greater probability of winning. So you can do the same thing with the Canada Pension Plan. You can, um, excuse me, you with the CPP, you can uh, multiply the, the gain or loss I was showing in that chart um, by uh, by the probability of death happening at that age. So, for example, I showed at age 69 that the loss was $46,000. But the probability of death at 69 is pretty minuscule. It's only 0.9%. And as a result, the expected loss is uh, is only uh, uh, 46,000 times 0.9% or about $400, $400. We can do the same thing at all the other ages. And now we have a, a very different looking chart. Yeah, there are still losses happening before age 80. So you're, you are leaving a little money on the table if you die before age 80. But you can see the probability of that happening is pretty small. I mean, when you weight those uh, gains and losses by probability. Those bar, red bars look pretty small now, whereas the uh, the purple bars, which are the the gains of due to waiting until 70, are much larger, um, especially uh, as one progresses beyond age 80. Um, and this shows you know, pretty conclusively that uh, it's much better to be waiting if you if, even if you're trying to maximize um, 
your value of your CPP and you're trying to avoid leaving money on the table. It's You're much better off. Uh, at least the odds are much more in your favor. And that's because there's only about a chance in five of actually uh, getting, uh, sorry, of actually dying before age 80 if you're a male age 65. Only a chance in five. And if you're a woman 65, there's even less than a chance in five of dying before age 80. So you have to consider probabilities for them the same way as you would for the predators and the leaves. And if you do all that, then uh, it shows that you are much better uh, starting at 70. So that's so that's the, the the biggest reason people give, um, i.e., not wanting to leave money on the table. And when you look at it, when you analyze it uh, more closely, you find that that reasoning doesn't really have a lot of um, doesn't really have a lot of merit to it. There's other reasons given for why people uh, don't want to wait until age 70. Of course, one of them um, looks like it makes sense on the surface but doesn't, if you look more closely, is they might say, well, I had a spotty earnings record. So um, I actually stopped working. Let's say you stopped working at age 60, and you only worked 20 years up until then. Well, you don't get the full CPP benefit. Um, uh, you actually only get about one half of the benefit starting at 60. And um, and let's say you had no earnings at 60, after 60 at all, say between 60 and 70. So if you start at 60, actually, you get 57% of the maximum. But that's because there are some dropout years. You don't have to count all the years from age 18 to 60. You get to drop out about uh, seven of those years. Now, if you start at 65, um, you're, you have five more years of, of zero earnings down there because we've already assumed you have no earnings after 60. So what happens is you're only getting 49% of the maximum. Um, so it looks like, uh, and by the way, if you start at 70, you're also getting 49% of the maximum. That's because they don't count the years after 65 uh, as contributory years, but they do count it between 60 and 65. So this kind of makes it look like, well, I better start it at 60 because I don't want those uh, years of no, no earnings to dilute my record further. But if you look at the value of the pension, remember, if you start at age 60, uh, you're only getting 64% um, of the maximum. That's because there's a 7.2% um, reduction in your or penalty in taking CPP early for every year between 60 and 65. So as a result of which, uh, the value of the pension at 60 uh, is smaller than it is later on. So even if you're getting 57%, the value is uh, on just $81,000 if you started at 60. By comparison, if you start at 65, the value is $93,000. And if you start at 870, the value is $112,000. So even though you're getting a smaller percentage of the maximum CPP, you still have a bigger value by starting late. So having a, a spotty earnings record is not really a good reason for uh, for not waiting until 70. There's other reasons, Kevin. Um, uh, first of all, not knowing how deferral works, well, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you don't know how, how it works, then you're going to go with the what most uh, almost everyone else does, the mainstream mind of thinking. And hopefully I've um, shown some of how it works today. Um, and another reason I hear often, and I, so it has to be addressed, but it actually makes no sense, is um, people say, I want to spend my money now. I don't want to wait until age uh, 70 or 80. Um, I want to enjoy it when I'm still young. I don't understand this reasoning because I'm not saying they can't spend their money or they can't uh, have, you know, they spend their money when they're younger. I'm just saying that they aren't spending their CPP dollars. So they're spending more of other dollars, like money from their RIF. And remember, money is fungible. Um, when you school spending it, you don't really know if that dollar came from your Canada pension plan or whether it came from your RIF. A dollar is a dollar. So I'm saying, sure, if you want to spend more money when you're younger, then go ahead and do so. Just take it from the RIF and uh, and don't touch the CPP until age 70. Another reason, and this is another good one from the perspective of the uh, retiree, and that is that financial advisors generally advise against it. I think uh, financial advisors, well, first of all, there may, may be some vested interest in, in not uh, – wanting people to touch their RIF, but there's also maybe a, a lack of total knowledge. I, I pointed out, for example, that the CPP at age uh, 70 is not 42% bigger. It's more more like 50% bigger. I don't think very many people know this, even financial advisors, even actuaries, actually, for that matter. Um, another reason given um, is that fear that CPP may not be there for you. 
There were a lot of scare stories 25 years ago in the papers about CPP. At that point in time, it was a pay-as-you-go system. Uh, contributions were going up uh, year after year. The contribution rate it looked like it was going to have to explode at some point and even become unsustainable. And uh, there were projections done to say that unless something's done to correct this, then the CPP fund is going to run out by the year 2015. This is how we talked back in 1992. Um, and uh, so the reason is, as I said, it was pay as you go. Um, it, it wasn't a sustainable uh, funding percentage going in. And so, secondly, the, and it wasn't being very well invested either. The money was given out to the provinces to do what they wanted with it. They were uh, not not giving a, a market rate of interest to the fund. So it was flawed. Uh, fortunately for us, those flaws were fixed. Um, the, the funding model was changed from pay as you go to a more sustainable model. The, the chief actuary now looks out 75 years and beyond in order to, and it looks at all the possible things that might affect the uh, contribution rate, like uh, unemployment rates, uh, fertility rates, mortality rates, uh, everything essentially, and, uh, and, and stress tests. That, and based on that, he, with, with the finding is that there is uh, virtually no concern about the CBP for the next 75 years and beyond. I, this should not be a reason for taking CPP early. Another reason um, people might give is, well, you know, you're showing what happens if returns are terrible, if they're at the, the bottom of that uh, bar, it's like fifth percentile returns. But I'm pretty confident I'm going to get good investment returns. Well, I, I would say great, more power to you, and uh, good luck with that. But um, as I said earlier, we should be uh, hoping for the best, but ex but planning for the worst. And we can't be confident, of course, of good returns, especially these days. Now that the markets have been going up uh, pretty much uh, on a, in, a, in a straight line for the last nine years, and we might be overdue for a pretty significant correction. But um, bad times can come. No one really knows what it's going to be happening with investments. So I would say let's not uh, do it for that reason. But even if it, that were the reason, um, we're going to find that it still makes sense to start CPP late. So we saw earlier this kind of a chart. Now, this chart looks a little different than what we saw earlier. In this case, uh, we are assuming that investment returns are at the median. And you might remember from that earlier chart I showed, median returns for a 60-40 mix after fees were about 5% a year, 45 to 5% a year. So I'm now assuming that the fund is earning better. And as a result, money doesn't run out until Carl hits age 86. Before, you might remember, um, it's, they ran, the money ran out when Carl hit age 82. So so things are better now. But obviously, there's still a pretty big gap, and money does, still does run out. And here's what happens if you start CPP late. Money now doesn't run out until Carl hits age 91. So even if you're assuming that your returns are going to be more like median or average returns, you're still better off starting it at age 70. So what's the final reason? Well, the final reason is just safety in numbers. You might figure millions of people can't be wrong. Everyone is doing it. So it must be for a reason. Uh, for everybody, somebody must be missing something. Um, and Because after all, if millions of people are doing something, then how can how can they possibly be wrong? Well, I guess we could have said the same thing uh, in the 2016 election. I'll leave it at that. Now, there actually are some good reasons for not waiting until age 70 to start your CPP. And the biggest reason is uh, simply not having enough savings. Um, if you start at 60, uh, between 65 and 70, CPP payments for uh, for one person might total about $60,000. For two people, uh, maybe $120,000. And on top of that, you also need to have some extra cash around for emergencies. So, uh, very roughly, you probably want to have $200,000 in savings net of any debt um, at age 65 if you want to wait until 70 to start CPP. Um, if you have less than that, it really doesn't work. Another reason might be short life expectancy. I mentioned earlier that there's only a chance in five that a male will die between age 65 and 80. Now, that would be on average. Um, you may have good medical reasons as to why you think uh, death was going to happen sooner. And if there are some good and valid reasons, then that might actually tip the scales in favor of starting CPP early. But remember, for the normal male, uh, I don't mean the, the athlete, but the normal male, 
there's only a chance in five of that happening. Third, um, you continue employment past 65. This is a complicated reason, but one that is important if you are still working after 65. And I, I covered this in the Global Mail article uh, about a year ago or so, and I had you know, no more than, say, eight or ten experts actually write to me and tell me I, I got my facts all wrong and that isn't how it worked. It turned out that is exactly how it worked. It was actually corroborated by the Office of the Chief Factuary of the CPP. Um, it just seemed to be so um, a, a, a monstrous, so egregiously wrong that they figured it can't possibly work this way. So let me explain what I'm talking about. Let's say you've earned the maximum Canada Pension Plan benefit by age 65, so you had high enough earnings for enough years to have the maximum, which remember earlier was 11.34 of a um, monthly pension. Now, if you stop working and start CPP at age 70, you get that maximum benefit plus the 42% increase I mentioned earlier. That's simply what I, I, I was uh, explaining a few slides back. If you keep working, and start CPP 870, you are required to keep on contributing. You have no choice if you, uh, under these circumstances. So you have to keep on contributing, but you get the same pension at age 70. In other words, those five additional years of contribution don't produce any extra pension for you. And uh, that ends up being expensive. These days, um, the contribution rate to CPP is about 2,000, uh, uh, over $2,500 uh, for, for the individual. And for self-employed people, it'd be over $5,000. So as a result of this, um, for a self-employed person, it could be out of pocket by $26,000 because of this, what I call dumb rule. Um, and so that's going to, it's going to, uh, you know, irritate a lot of people that uh, they have to put, they have to keep on contributing for five more years if they defer the CPP until 70, even though they don't get any more CPP pension. So, um, and I can understand people, you know, not wanting to see that happen and starting the CPP early for that reason alone. But let's get real. I mentioned reason two, short lifespan. Well, that's only going to apply in a very small percentage of cases. It doesn't apply for a very, a very, very many people in the population. Also, um, the, uh, the same happens with reason number three, continued employment. Uh, the number of people who actually have the maximum CPP at 65 and keep on contributing is fairly small. So um, that doesn't really apply very often. What we can say then is that the vast majority of people who do have sufficient assets, like $200,000 a year, to delay CPP until 70 should do so. Now, back to that EBRI study. Uh, it showed, as uh, you'll remember, that uh, people with $500,000 or more in assets still had almost 90% of their money after 18 years into retirement. So retirees, for whatever reason, they want to keep their, their savings intact. I think the main reason is uh, fear of the unknown. Uh, they don't know what they don't know, so they figure as long as they keep the money intact, then they're, they have that buffer to handle whatever comes up. Another fear, of course, is leaving money on the table. They don't want to give away that money to um, an insurance company to buy an annuity because they might die. So they want to keep their money intact and not spend it. Now, the trouble is that that kind of thinking doesn't align well with maximizing retirement income. Um, so I concluded, and this was covered in an article that appeared in the Globe and Mail about two weeks ago, that what hap what's happening is that we typically underspend in our 60s and 70s out of fear of the unknown. And then we c continue to underspend in our 80s, even though we're no longer afraid of the unknown. But that's because we now have a lost appetite or ability to keep on spending. Um, so this all suggests that we ought to be uh, adhering to a different model. If we ought to, if we could be somehow more confident of spending in our 60s and 70s uh, and spend a bit more, that would be a good thing. Uh, but we can't just do it by spending more money from our RIF because that doesn't make us comfortable. However, we can do it by starting CPP late, and um, this chart kind of shows how. So. Um, this is what we had before, starting CPP early. The purple bars is the, the sure income. That's from CPP and old age security. And the orange bars are the unsure income apart from the RIF. Um, and this, as you remember before. Now, focus here on the on the purple bar parts of the bars on both the left and right charts. 
The purple bars, because it's running late, uh, it's much more, as we saw earlier, about 50% more. And so as you can see, those bars are much higher. What that means is uh, it, it ought to give us a lot more confidence in spending our money throughout our 70s um, because it's, it's from a sure source. We don't have to be worried that it's going to run out. We want to spend it. And so I think so. The fact, having a bigger CPT by starting it late is actually going to induce retirees to spend closer to their full potential and I think ultimately do them a favor. So if deferring CPP until age 70 makes so much sense, then why not defer old age security as well? Well, the main reason I would say is uh, the payoff from deferring OAS is, uh, to age 70 is less. Uh, the, uh, the bump at, at 70 for OAS is only going to be 36%. It's 7.2% per year not the 42 plus percent, which could be 50%, as I mentioned, uh, for CPP. So you get a much smaller um, bonus by starting it late. Also, it means, as, as it is now, people are already um, fearful of drawing down their savings too fast by uh, drawing more uh, RIF money and less CPP before 70. Um, I can't imagine there will be many people who'd be comfortable uh, doing that, that um, to an even greater uh, extent by drawing their C by waiting until 70 for OAS. Having said that, if all of your OAS income is being clawed back, and that means having earnings or income totaling 115,000 or more, if it's all being clawed back anyway at age 65, then you may as well wait until age 70 and keep your fingers crossed and hope that something is going to happen. So conclusions. One is that starting CPP at 70 is usually better than starting it at 65 and much better than starting it at age 60. It's an effective way to reduce investment risk and longevity risk um, for people with over $200,000 in savings and or, or and even up to over a million dollars in savings and beyond. Um, so it it uh, it's going to be an effective strategy for, for most people, most middle income to upper middle income people in retirement. We're always, it's being human nature, we're always going to be resisting uh, spending our capital. So delaying CPP um, reduces that natural urge to underspend because it produces more uh, sure income um, throughout our retirement. There are a few good reasons to take CPP early, um, uh, but very few, and those reasons apply only to a very, very small uh, percentage of people. So there's only a few reasons, good reasons to do it, and yet that is still what most people are doing. And finally, while deferring the enhancement to a CPP, which I call enhancement two, is important, uh, so are the other four enhancements. I found CPP um, deferral does close much of the gap. We can close the rest of the gap uh, in income by uh, by doing the other enhancements as well. And at this point, I'd be uh, happy to entertain questions. <laughs>